Welcome back to another episode of Alternative Space History. I am your host, So Not the Hero Type, and we're going to start off with a Skywatch 1 launched on an Osiris 2 launch vehicle. Now, the Skywatch initiative had one sole purpose to take photographs of the Earth and try to understand our planet and the space around it a little bit better. Unfortunately, Due to unforeseen circumstances, there were some issues with the initiative. The main issue being power. These cameras we sent out into space take a lot of power, and during initial testing, we showed that we'd have power for an average of 60 to 65 days. Unfortunately, after the 37th day of being in orbit, even with direct contact on the sun with the massive solar panel, it ran out of charge and we were not able to control or recover any of the scientific data. Since we were focusing more on lunar and human space flight coming up in the next few years, the Skywatch program has unfortunately been put on the back burner. The ship itself performed phenomenally and the whole crew was very happy with how it performed, but now we need to figure out how to best fix the power issue if we want to continue with the Skywatch program. Now phasing back over to the Vandenberg launch site, we have our second launch of the year in the Scout 2. This will be piloted by none other than Ziggy Kerman and his 8th career flight. After being grounded for 6 months due to destroying one of the X-07 X-planes after having a little bit too much fun after he was told to return it home. The new ground crew at Vandenberg Space Center was more than happy to accommodate this brave pilot. After several minutes of flight, making sure all systems were performing optimally, him and ground control decided that he was going to do a basic glide back to the runway so they can retrieve the data from the camera that has been strapped on the latest version of this prototype X-plane. As he glided back to the runway, everything seemed to be going according to plan until disaster struck. Unfortunately, it seems that there is still a slight issue with the weight and balance of that camera on the front of the plane. So while he was coming in for his final landing into Vandenberg, the plane suddenly stalled out and Ziggy was not able to regain control and was forced to eject yet again. This concluding the second version of the prototype Scout 2 X-Plane. After the recent failures, they decided to put this particular program onto the wayside as there are other ways they could possibly get camera data from the area and they figured it would just be best to go ahead and not risk the pilots' lives. Luckily, due to the launch escape system that we have put in all of our X-Planes so far, Ziggy Kerman was able to survive the ejection and land mostly safely on the surface just outside Vandenberg Space Center. Now switching back over to the Cape, we have Oliver Kerman flying the X-07 Explorer to attempt a 105 kilometer altitude. And if successful, breaking the previous record set by Carnassa, the owner of CSA Space Agency, when he broke the Kármán line last year. The flight profile and plan were going to be pretty much the same thing. He was going to be going on a more aggressive up pitch after he picked up a little bit of speed. After releasing the SRBs to get the initial kick on the kick stage, Oliver Kerman pulled back up on the controls and started aiming for new heights for New Horizon Space Center. The RCS system seemed to be functioning phenomenally and everything was going according to plan. This would be the first time that we attempted to breach the Kármán line and go even farther. After the studies from the last capsule on the Serenity X-Plane, we determined that they'd be able to go much higher without worrying about issues like suffocation. Unfortunately, due to some unforeseen issues, the plane started to lose control up in the higher atmosphere, which is, of course, typical for Oliver Kerman every time he tries to fly an X-Plane. Luckily enough, he was able to get a projected path to surpass the 105 kilometer and actually get closer to 110 kilometers. Now his only mission was to regain control of the now out of control aircraft 
so we can bring it down safely. Down on ground control, they were worried about him not being able to get the plane straightened out in time, and due to aerodynamic stresses from the suborbital reentry, ripping the plane apart, and also ripping Oliver Kerman apart in the process. After panic broke out, Oliver Kerman muted ground control and took over flight controls fully by himself, toggling the assist system on and off, trying to get a better control of the craft that was currently still creating out of control. Oliver Kerman, a highly trained pilot who was, had much experience with out of control aircrafts in his career, decided to just ignore ground control, take a deep breath, and get control of the plane so he can bring it down safely, not risking the craft and or his life. Amazingly, he was able to regain control of the craft and then decided to re-establish communications with ground control who were in shock and awe as they heard Oliver Kerman come back over the comms. Now, all Oliver had to do was follow the flight plan to do a nosedive following the prograde vector as close as possible and doing a pull up towards the end allowing the most aerodynamically stable re-entry as possible. The X-07 series was designed with a wider wing base to give it better glide control as well as a higher drag co-efficiency, allowing the craft to bleed off speed as it re-entered the thicker parts of the atmosphere. The re-entry is always a little bit of a rough ride, but the plane was designed to be able to take a high enough g-force to slow the plane down enough to give it a decent amount of control as he comes back to the thicker parts of the atmosphere, thus allowing the drag to slow the plane down, allowing him to realign with the runway and bring it down for landing. Unfortunately, due to the issues up in the atmosphere, he was not on the correct course and he was required to do a grass landing just outside the Cape Canaveral New Horizons Space Center. Now back over to the launch pad, our fourth launch of the year, a Manny 2, number 2, launched on the Osiris 2, so many 2s, doing the number 2, or the second lunar orbiter of the space agency. This was going to be a similar flight plan to the last lunar orbiter that we had done in the past, except for we wanted to give it a different tilt around the moon, that way more scientific research could be done on other areas of the lunar surface we have yet to orbit around. Surprisingly, nothing terrible happened. We did actually have a minor engine failure on one of the LR-79s towards the end of the ascent, but it was far enough down the road that we were able to keep the craft into orbit. The top stage successfully separating from the main booster and was able to glide itself in to a nice stable low earth orbit. Now all we had to do was get the injection stage to send us on an impact course so we can use the probe to make minor adjustments to prep to catch an orbit around the lunar surface like we had done in the last year. Everything seemed to go without a hitch, the stage burned exactly how we expected it to, thus sending the injection stage into an impact course with the lunar surface and allowing the probe to get ready to catch an orbit around the moon. Once getting into position to do a retrograde burn to catch an orbit around the moon, ground control prepped to plot a course to slightly adjust the inclination of the probe, that way it could be orbiting at a different angle compared to the last probe. There's a little bit of an issue on the first attempt for this, but after a few adjustments, they were able to lower the top of the orbit to a point that they liked after getting the inclination change done as they had planned. This would be making this probe get a little bit closer to the lunar surface compared to the other orbit that was done prior. But back over to the vehicle assembly building, we had our team hard at work designing a new satellite core to do multiple contracts in order to help funding for the program. This probe was adeptly named the EGGSAT probe as requested by the Discord chat, which I, for some reason, 
Should have known better, but did anyways when I asked you guys to help me name this. And, well, yeah. Anyways, here is the AGSAT-1 base core. It will be turned into the Storm-1, as well as the Navi, the SS Navi, which we'll be using to do some satellite contracts at the Vandenberg Air Base. And we will be using this with a new launch vehicle, the OTIS-2, which stands for Orbital Direct Insertion Ship. That's the best I could come up with. I thought about it for like three days. Either way, we decided to give this a very generic profile, allowing it to have some solar power if needed, as well as a certain payload capacity for certain sounding, navigational, and other payloads that can meet all contract requirements simply by adjusting what the payload had inside of it. Now, typically when we build a launch vehicle, we do build it without the probe in mind unless it's a specific launch vehicle and unfortunately I wanted to make sure that this could do a bunch of other stuff and then decided to do some changes to it a little bit later but here we are designing the Otis 2 which is going to be taking a similar path as the Osiris 1 but using more advanced upgraded lighter tanks that could hold more fuel. The Otis 2 would actually be taking over the Osiris 1 and Osiris 2 launch vehicles for the future of the space agency. There is two variants of the ship, only one being featured this year, but the Otis 1 and the Otis 1 Heavy, which is a six booster variant of the Otis 1. Due to the light weight of the tanks and the decreased physical mass, we were able to actually set up a six booster system giving us a much higher payload capacity without exceeding the current launch pad limits. The Otis program was originally intended for human spaceflight, but due to the requirements for certain satellite contracts, we decided to kind of make it one and the same, having a slight, slight variation between the satellite probe and the human space contracts that we were hoping to do in the near future by slightly lowering the thrust vectoring on the human rated one so we didn't end up pushing too many g-forces on ascent for our pilots. Now unfortunately the first time we rolled this out we got the N9 famous wiggle 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 and we had to roll it back, do some minor changes and bring it back out to the pad. So this is our fifth launch, the SS Navi on the Otis 1 our first contract for the navigational satellite and sun synchronous orbit, which we were able to combine both contracts together due to the requirements of said contracts. The Otis 1 did phenomenal. It was able to get into orbit without a hitch, had plenty of delta V and excellent control. We were reusing these same engines that we had been using on the Osiris 2, so we had plenty of engine data and concerns of failure were not really on the top of the list. Now, as the Otis-1 went up to make its very first orbit, everyone on ground control was patiently waiting to make sure nothing bad did in fact happen. The booster separation was successful, and the main core stage did successfully carry the AGSAT SS Navi into orbit. Once in orbit, we didn't have to make any real major adjustments as we were able to do a pre-planned trajectory using the main booster. The SS Navi does have some RCS and Delta V, so it can make adjustments while it is in orbit in case the contract requires it. After the success of the Otis first launch, everyone on ground control was excited as ever because it meant the Otis was a viable rocket for at least satellite contracts. Which was perfect because the next launch is going to be the second launch of the Otis series rockets, which will be shooting up the next AGSAT satellite, Storm 1, to do the first weather satellite contract to help, again, add additional funding to New Horizons Space Center. This is going to be a slightly different variation of flight path as the requirements and inclination requirements for the contract were slightly different, which was why we couldn't do all three in one launch. But regardless, the cost of the Otis 1 being cheaper than the Osiris 2 and everything else involved, we are still able to make a decent amount of funding from this contract. 
Now back at the Cape, we are doing our seventh launch on an Osiris 2, the Manny 3 probe. The Manny 3 will be the first probe to leave our system and go past the lunar surface. This is going to be more or less a solar scientific probe as well as an antenna test to see exactly what limitations we currently have. The other thing being, we wanted to see exactly how much an injection stage would require to do a Venus contract and possibly a Mars contract here in the near future. The launch went without a hitch. Of course, these are rockets and engines we have been using for quite some time now. So again, the chance of failure, or at least concern for failure, was relatively low. Once we got into orbit, we plotted a minor maneuver to aim again roughly for Venus's line of orbits and just fired along that marker until all the fuel has been spent out of the engines. And with all of the fuel expended, we detached the probe core off the injection stage and hoped we'd keep contact as the probe left Earth's sphere of influence for the very, very first time. After passing all redundancy checks, the scientific experiments were activated, the antenna was deployed, and we watched, holding our breath as the probe went into space that we have yet to examine in the history of mankind. That flight did give us tons of data actually, so we did go ahead and go over to the R&D building and start to unlock some more tech. Our main goal was to try to get better engines, better power like RTGs or better solar panels for interplanetary stuff as well as try to unlock better capsules. After the R&D team successfully plotted off their new technological advances, we started to work on the very first human rated spaceship, the Outreach 1, as man was planning to outreach to the stars. As stated before, the Outreach 1 was going to be designed to work on a Otis 1 launch vehicle that had a slightly lower thrust with the side boosters using a slightly different variant LR-79 to help keep the G-forces down for our brave pilots. During the construction design of this outreach program rocket, we wanted to make sure that A, we could bring our pilots back from orbit, B, in case of emergency, we could eject the pilots from the rest of the ship and bring them down safely. Safety was our number one concern. After double checking all of the base stats of everything we've designed with the new capsules we have just unlocked, we decided to give it a little more power and a little more resources so we can have the capsule in orbit for up to 24 hours with a little bit of room to spare. That way we can study not only the effects of humans in space, but also the effects of humans in space for prolonged periods of time. This was a new concept for the agency. So after months of planning, testing, a bunch of math that I don't quite understand, the Outreach 1 was officially designed to be launched in the near future. But back out to the pad, our second Skywatch 1 attempt is underway. This will be the 8th launch of the year for New Horizons Space Center. Running two separate launch pads has really increased our output for launches each year, allowing us to make more funds, generate more science, but also spend more money. It was at this point the agency decided to start slowing down their multiple projects to hopefully retain funding to keep the station going. Because of this, some cost-saving measures were taken into effect, including this launch. Using the Otis-1 and its non-heavy variant to bring down the cost of something that wouldn't return any funding meant we'd have to use part of the return stage to finalize our orbit. So to make sure we'd be able to bring back the return capsule, a little bit of propellant was added to the Skywatch probe. Unfortunately, due to an oversight from the R&D team, it meant the avionics were no longer sufficient to control the probe once in space. And due to the lack of control during its suborbital part of its flight, we weren't able to regain control in time to get it into an orbit, which means the range safety feature had to be activated to explode the probe while in the vacuum of space to prevent any possible damage 
to any civilization or population below. Now back to the administrative team, we decided to accept the government contract to put the first man into space as we were ready to test the outreach program for the first time. After doing a little bit of soul searching, we realized we could fit this launch in before the end of the year. So without further ado, J. Fox Kerman, the brave pilot, is going to be the first hopeful man into orbit for more than a suborbital trajectory and we're gonna to hope to keep him into space for at least 24 hours. Being we are using, yet again, engines that we have been using in the agency for years now, failure wasn't the biggest issue. It was the new capsule and life support system we were hoping that would not cause any issues. The ascent profile we used was a real basic one. We tried to keep the G-forces to a minimum so we didn't do any serious harm to the pilots. The launch itself was a success as the outreach slowly but surely reached itself into a stable orbit of about 155 kilometers. The first attempt to put a man into space, we didn't want to go too far just to be on the safe side. As J. Fox Kerman was about to reach orbital velocity, he radioed back to mission control something that would ring throughout the nations, giving hope to future generations of space flight. The view from here is absolutely beautiful. I wish you guys could experience what I'm feeling right now. Even if you didn't bring me back to Earth safely, I would die a happy man. But I have faith in all of you. Now that we have achieved putting a man into orbit, all that was left to do was separate the escape system and hope he could survive for the next 24 hours in space. His vitals were being monitored very closely just in case they had to end the mission early. They would fire up the retrograde burning system to bring him back down before the 24 hour mark. Jay Fox, although feeling a little bit stressed from being in uh, such a tiny enclosed space for so long, held out because he wanted to be the first man to last 24 hours into space. And we are happy to say he did exactly that. After reaching right around the 24 hour and 36 minute mark, we started the retrograde burning process, which will bring down J Fox's speed just enough to put him on a very shallow re-entry, hoping it would decrease the chances of extreme G-forces and cause the pilot to not pass out due to excessive pull on the capsule. The only other worry the team had was the re-entry heating in the parachute system, which again was tested extensively prior to this launch. But still, in the real world, you never know what could happen. As Jay Fox started to slowly but surely come back into the Earth's atmospheres, he could feel the heat of the capsule start to slowly increase and he can already feel the pressure starting to build up. Bracing himself for what would surely be an extreme ride back down to the blue marble he calls home, he was ready for anything and everything that was coming his way. J. Fox Kerman was silent the entire flight as he came back down as ground control tried to contact him several times by testing and monitoring his vitals as soon as he hit the thicker parts of the atmosphere and things got extremely spicy but we were happy to say he did not pass out he did experience some high g's and had a little bit of a headache and everything else seemed to function properly now that was left was hopefully having the parachute deploy properly and bring him down to a safe speed as he lands in the desert And with that, the parachute deployment was a success. As long as it didn't get any damage or shred during the opening, he would have been fine. J. Fox Kerman slowly falls back down to the surface of the planet he calls home, knowing he has changed history for the better.
closely watching the stats on the screen to make sure he didn't lose his parachute and come tumbling back down onto Earth's surface, he landed with a plop. Ignoring Mission Control's commands to stay put, J. Fox decided to get out and look at the capsule out of curiosity and wanted to make sure there was no damage to make sure he really was safe the entire time. Unfortunately, he tripped and fell off the ladder, now not able to get back into the capsule, which meant he had to stand outside in, in the desert for an extended period of time while he waited for the rescue team and the recovery team to come pick him up. Standing there in the desert, he felt overcome with the sense of success and happiness for being the first man to ever enter space and come back down safely. With the success of this amazing feat, the agency realized they had enough funding and science to push forward even further to do more human exploration in space. But at that point, that is the end of the video. I'd like to thank you guys again for stopping by. If you like the video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you guys would like to see more, feel free to subscribe to the channel. As always, I'll leave a link to the Discord in the description if you guys want to come join that and check it out. But other than that, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking now and let you guys go. And hopefully I will see you guys in our next year, in the next decade, the year 1960.